joining us today for our Biden Indian American Town Hall. We really appreciate you being gone. Uh, as you know, uh, we received the sad news of Congressman John Lewis's passing. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to have a moment of silence to recognize him and all the great, great work he's done all across the country for all our community. So if we could just have uh, a minute of uh, silence, we'd appreciate that. Thank you for that. Uh, my, my name is Amit Jani. I'm the National Asian American Pacific Islander Director for the Biden Campaign. And as an Indian American myself, I'm so proud that we're all coming together today to make a difference uh, in this election cycle. Uh, as we'll hear from our panelists today, the Indian American community has grown in size, influence, and in our political and civic in involvement. Being from Jersey City, New Jersey myself, I know just growing up uh, in a largely diverse and densely populated Indian American community, we're seeing more community members across the country uh, run for public office, whether that's in Arizona, uh, Texas, or many other states. Uh, more Indian Americans are joining politics and government as staffers, including some of the folks you'll see and hear from today, uh, and others on our campaign like Maju Verghese, who's our chief operating officer, or Meta Raj, who's our digital chief of staff on the Biden campaign. Uh, and very importantly, everyday members of our community like yourselves are doing their part by helping to volunteer for campaigns all across uh, the spectrum, hosting phone banks, taking part in fundraisers, writing op-eds in support of the vice president and so much more. 
as we all know, our election in November uh, for president is going to be historic, and we really need your help, the support from the Indian American community to really make a difference. So please join us through our Indian, Indian American outreach for the Biden campaign. We'll also be following up after this town hall on ways you can get more involved with the Biden campaign. So without further ado, I want to thank the AAPI Victory Fund and Indian American Impact Project uh, for co-hosting this town hall, as well as our wonderful panelists. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Shaker Narasimhan, who is the chairman and founder of the AAPI Victory Fund, an organization focused exclusively on building the political power of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. With that, I'll turn it over to Shaker. And thank you, Amit. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you all very, very much uh, for giving us a little piece of your afternoon on a Saturday. On behalf of the AAPI Victory Fund, which serves as an umbrella political group for the many nationalities that make up the Asian American Native Highlander, a Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, it's a large diaspora, just like, frankly, the Indian American diaspora is. Um, we have co-hosts, uh, South Asians for Biden, who are a grassroots organization that we'll tell you about at the end and how you connect with them, and Impact Pack, which has done quite a bit of work with the Indian American community, stimulating uh, folks to run for campaigns. So welcome to this Indian American community town hall. We believe that this electorate has come of age. And a couple of slides that I'm going to show you are going to tell you why we are important to this election, why we are doing this, and why you will see so much engagement with the Biden campaign. So first of all, we had well over 800 registrants for this event, which itself tells you something with regard to what kind of interest there is in talking about this issue of politics in 2020 and the fact that our community is already woke. The question is, are we ready, as Amit says, to step up with volunteers and votes to deliver the White House to Joe Biden. So are we willing to be more proactive? Um, as you all know, and as Amit mentioned, last night we heard the sad news, news of the passing of an icon of civil rights, Representative John Lewis. Uh, I've heard from a number of Indian Americans who live in Georgia 5, which is the district he represented proudly for two decades, three decades almost. Um, Chairman Perez knew him well. And so I'm going to ask Chairman Perez to say a few words about him at the beginning of his remarks. Now, just for a very quick overview of the Indian electorate. Um, and if we can have the slides, uh, Weber. So this is prepared for us by our data guru, Karthik Ramakrishnan. Um, next. So first of all, it, just so you know that for the first time in 2018, most of these slides are 2018, some 16, and some have a little bit more information, and we'll have a copy of this for you. So I'm going to run through them very quickly. Indian, Indians represented for the first time the second highest number of naturalizations by country of birth in 2018. It means that we are beginning to want to participate in American politics. Next. As a share of the overall uh, API population, and we call it adult citizen, because what we're interested in for voting purposes is, are you over the age of 18 and are you a US citizen? So this represents the likely voter population. Indian Americans represent the third highest percentage of the various groups within the API umbrella. Next. And what is important about the Indian American voting patterns is it is consistently high, not low, to the contrary. It is high, it got bigger in 2018, but it's still lower than white turnout. And so there's room for us to get further and you will see how that data will work. And we are among the strongest Asian American democratic voters. Next. So what has happened is First of all, it leads to citizenship. Lead, you have to register to vote, you register to vote, and then you actually vote. And you can see those percentages for Indians are highest in these communities, but there's no reason that we should not have at least 80% registered, and we no reason we can't have 70% voting. Next. And what happened in the midterms was, which is much lower typically than the presidential, there was a big jump across the board in voting patterns. As you can see, in 2014 midterms, Asian Indians voted 26% in 2018, 47, 21 point big difference. So let's try to make that happen next time and watch what we can do 
in, 20, uh, in 2020. Next. First of all, I said favorability, and you, ask, you would ask, well, how favorable is this a Democratic vote? In the Clinton vote, it was 77% uh, Democratic. Today, in all the polls and surveys, the favorability for Biden over Trump is 2.3 to 1, very close to what it was then. Is there a reason we could not aspire to 75 to 80 percent of Indian Americans voting for Joe Biden? In my opinion, no, not if we do the work. That's the bottom line. Final slide. Here's the numbers. Bottom line, there are eight battleground states. Uh, it may narrow and it may expand, but this is where uh, you will hear and see the concentration of resources going today. And of course, we're going to have um, somebody very senior in the campaign talk to us as well. But just take a look. There are 1.3 million Indian American adult citizens, back to my definition, who are eligible to vote in these states. It is our goal to deliver 1 million of those to actually vote in, by November 3rd, 2020, and vote for a Democratic candidate, namely for Joe Biden. Thank you um, for the slides. Appreciate it. They will be available to you. Bottom line for us is now, how do we get this activated and make it work? So may I please welcome to the stage um, Tom Perez, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and Julie Chavez Rodriguez, senior advisor to the Biden campaign. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Shekhar, for your very kind introduction. And thank you and to everyone who organized this uh, incredible event. Uh, the number of people here on a Saturday afternoon is remarkable. It's a tribute to the determination of everyone. And I want to thank all the panelists and organizers. The next panel is a panel of all stars. And I've had the privilege of working with many of them, and uh, they are truly remarkable. Uh, Julie uh, is a good friend and a great uh, leader who uh, is indispensable to the Biden campaign. We are all so honored uh, to be working together hand in glove. We are one uh, because we have 108 days till the weekend. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a night owl like my mother. Uh, so I was up last night uh, at about 11.30 when I got the word about uh, John Lewis. And I'll be honest with y'all, I, I haven't stopped thinking about it ever since because, um, you know, there's a wonderful baseball player, Lou Gehrig, who uh, once said when he retired because of the illness now named after him, he said, I feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth. And with all due respect to Lou Gehrig, I kind of feel that way because I got to work for Senator Kennedy in the 90s and, and then Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, uh, so many other folks. And, and when I worked for Senator Kennedy, I remember vividly, I, I had the privilege of um, helping to write the original version of what became the Shepherd Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2009. It took 14 years to pass that. I bring this story up because I remember Senator Kennedy saying, we've got to go talk to John Lewis because you can't have a hate crimes bill introduced without talking to John Lewis. And um, any of you who know the traditions of the House and the Senate, um, usually what happens is um, House members come over to the Senate. Uh, it's it's uh, not necessarily fair, but it was kind of the practice. Not for Senator Kennedy. We go see John Lewis because Senator Kennedy and all of us held him in such esteem. I, I think about the moment we're in right now where we have leadership that so divides us. And I think about John Lewis and I think of um, a uniter, a compassionate healer, a, someone who had the remarkable fortitude to forgive the daughter of George Wallace. Uh, forgiveness is such a hard thing in life. Uh, but for John Lewis, uh, he understood uh, the necessity of empathy and compassion, loving thy neighbor, loving thy enemy, uh, which is really, really hard. Uh, he, was, he was short of physical stature, but he was certainly a, a titan in the movement. And, and it's frankly impossible to overstate um, the depth of the loss. On top of uh, just a day earlier, the loss of another titan in the movement, C.T. Vivian, uh, who uh, was there with Dr. King as well. 
uh, I, we put out a video and, and um, it embodied um, really the essence of what we are talking about today. Um, and I invite you to go take a look at it. It's about a minute. It's all clips of John Lewis. And one of the things he said, and he said it often, is that voting is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. And I can think of no better tribute to pay to John Lewis than to have this discussion and to redouble our efforts to make sure every single person eligible to vote gets out there and votes. Uh, Shekhar, you have uh, been, no, go ahead. I want to make a quick comment that many people don't seem to know that John Lewis was a great friend of India's. In fact, one of the last bills that he introduced in December 2019 was called the Gandhi Legacy Bill, where he tried to get 150 million in scholarships so that people from here, young people on both, in both countries, could study nonviolence through the eyes of Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. Um, it's a great loss for our community as well. The parallels between John Lewis and Gandhi are so evident in how he lived. And I hope we will all remember. I, I sent a note to my three children this morning explaining why their dad was so upset. Because we have to make sure that we never forget people like John Lewis. It, it's just so critically important. And the vote is what it was all about. The Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, which someday I hope will become the John Lewis Bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. That is what it's all about. That's what this fight is about. And you know, on, on, we've seen some dark moments in the last three and a half years, but on the darkest nights, we so often see the brightest stars. And, and Shekhar, you are one of them. You have been mm -hmm. such a friend for so long. I know so many people on this call. I got so many texts in the run up to this call from former colleagues so excited here. Folks, the most important thing we can do is get out there and vote. I was looking, I took a screenshot of the slide of Indian American voters in various uh, states. And I'm, I'm looking at it right now. In Michigan, 125,000 Indian American votes. We lost Michigan by 10,700 votes in 2016. In Pennsylvania, 156,000. We lost Pennsylvania by 42, 43,000. In Wisconsin, uh, 37,000. We lost Wisconsin by 21,000 in 2016. I could go around the horn, but I will just stop with those three there to say the Indian American vote, the AAPI vote more, more broadly uh, can be an absolute difference maker. The, when you look at the um, evolution of voting patterns in 1992, if you were to aggregate the votes of uh, Ross Perot and George Herbert Walker Bush, the AAPI vote was roughly two thirds Republican. Now you go to Obama and you've seen that reversed. And then the stats that you just showed, it continues to be more and more and more democratic and a bigger and bigger and bigger denominator. And that is the work that we must continue. And the reason for that is simple. And that is the values of the Democratic Party are the values of the AAPI community. We understand that opportunity should be there for everyone. We understand that immigration is what has always made America great and always will. I have so much appreciation for all the healthcare workers, AAPI healthcare workers in the front lines, many of whom have made the ultimate sacrifice in this pandemic. And this pandemic has laid bare the utter incompetence of this president. I wanna say thank you to people like Dr. Murthy and others um, who've been out there. Dr. Murthy is uh, an, a, a seasoned professional. Thank God he was around in the Obama administration during Ebola and other crises. That's the illustration of the importance of having seasoned professionals and most importantly, a president who will listen to seasoned professionals. Every so often, in our nation's journey to form a more perfect union, um, there's a person that meets a moment. And I think we're at one of these moments. Uh, we need a healer in chief. We need a uniter in chief. We need a commander in chief that can talk to anyone around the world and command respect because that person knows that leader. That is Joe Biden. And the reason I am so enthusiastic as someone who started working uh, with Joe Biden 25 years ago in the US Senate. 
we need him desperately because we need leaders with compassion. We need leaders with competence. We need leaders with a bold vision. And when you look at the platform document that will be soon released, that is a bold vision for an America that works for everyone. We need to make sure that we address this pandemic and Joe Biden has a plan for that. We need to make sure we address the economic depression. And, and I use that word carefully, but accurately that has resulted from this president's failure, abject failure to pay attention. We need a president who can unite us, who doesn't throw gasoline on the fire in the aftermath of unconscionable events like the murder of George Floyd. We need a healer in chief, a consoler in chief. And that is why it is so important. We have made dramatic investments in the infrastructure necessary to win. We're so proud to be partnering with the Biden campaign. I come to you folks with both uh, sobriety and optimism. Sobriety born out of the fact that we have three different crises in this country right now. Sobriety born out of the fact that we have the most dangerous president in American history, a president utterly incapable to do the job, utterly incapable of summoning any sort of compassion or empathy that John Lewis modeled in his life and Joe Biden has modeled throughout his life. But I come to you with unrelenting optimism because I see so many bright stars everywhere we go. I know we can do this. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues moving ahead. The one thing I would say to you all in closing is we cannot be complacent. When I read these polls that say he's up by nine or up by 10, no way folks, this is gonna get closer. Don't believe those polls. What I love about the Biden team and what I love about the DNC team is everybody is hungry, everybody is humble, everybody is hardworking, and everybody is in it together. And we are hustling to the finish line, 108 days till the weekend. And just <laughs> think about those three states alone that I mentioned. The Indian American vote alone can be the difference in moving forward. And we've made unprecedented investments in data, technology, organizing, all of the critical elements and also voter protection. All of these elements we continue to invest in so that we can win, but we know we can't win without your help. So thank you so much. And I wanna turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, who has been a remarkable leader in every job she has had and uh, continues to do so now. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you so much, Shaker, for inviting me to join you all today and to Amit for being a tremendous leader on our campaign, um, you know, throughout the, you know, primaries and now into the general election. As the chairman mentioned, you know, we are so excited about the opportunities that we have, um, you know, ahead of us to really be able to organize and engage all of our communities. Um, we know that it's going to take re really rebuilding uh, the Obama-Biden coalition of voters to ensure that we have not just a victory in November, but we have a strong win to, that will enable us to you know, implement the robust agenda that we know Vice President Biden has already laid out, um, not just for the Indian American and API communities, but across the board for all of our communities. We know we're facing unprecedented times right now. Um, we're in the middle of a public health crisis. We're dealing with an ensuing and growing economic crisis. Um, you know, our country has uh, definitely been, um, I think, raw with the, you know, racial tension or racial injustice that we have been combating and fighting for so long. Um, and much of this has been, as the chairman mentioned, exacerbated by the inability of the individual in the White House currently to lead and to have a plan of action to be able to move our country forward. And we know that we're dealing with unprecedented times and that's gonna require an unprecedented, you know, level of organizing and level of engagement from all of our communities. You know, this cycle we are facing, um, you know, many things that, um, you know, from I think some of the misinformation that we've already begun to experience, um, whether it's, you know, misinformation that is, um, is nefarious or those that are coming directly from the Trump campaign um, in his attempts to continuously try to, um, you know, redefine who Joe Biden is. But we know exactly who Joe Biden is, and we know what Joe has stood for throughout his career um, as a committed public servant, 
as a, you know, a single father for some time raising two boys um, with tremendous values and character to then go on to serve, um, you know, uh, Bo in the military. Um, so we've seen a tremendous amount of character from him and that's the kind of leadership that we need right now. Now, in addition to the misinformation that we are gonna have to combat, we know, as the chairman mentioned, that there are going to be voter suppression efforts, that there are efforts underway to limit, you know, vote by mail or limit some of the kinds of, um, you know, more expansive voting options that we're going to need to make sure that everybody feels safe and to be able to vote in November. We cannot be in a position and we need to continue to, you know, push the fact that we can do both we can exercise our fundamental right as a, as a democracy and as voters to be able to vote, and we could do so safely. And that's something that we're gonna need to continue to organize around and continuing to advocate for. Um, we know that we're gonna face you know, uh, ongoing foreign interference. We've already seen um, folks like um, Russia trying to um, you know, manipulate the elections in the ways that they did in 2016. So we need you all as an echo chamber, as trusted messengers with your community, as trusted validators, to ensure that you're getting the key messages of Joe Biden out to your folks, to your networks, um, because we have to make sure that we are combating misinformation with the facts, with the truth, and with trusted individuals like yourselves that are joining us today. Um, and we know, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity to engage our communities, to organize our communities, to really be able to build the kind of power that we know is possible and necessary to win in, 26, or in 2020. Um, and just to highlight, you know, um, the chairman mentioned a couple of the key states. Um, I know that, you know, as we are looking at organizing, um, our organizing efforts in Pennsylvania, we wanna make sure that we're engaging key leaders from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. As we're looking at organizing in Texas, we want to know who those leaders are in Dallas and in Houston. In Florida, who are the folks in Tampa that we should be talking to and making sure are connected to our state teams? Ohio, you know, the Cleveland folks. We know that there are important, you know, um, sectors of the Indian American community throughout our country, throughout our battleground states, and we want to make sure we're, you know, engaging and connecting directly with you all, with the key leaders there. Um, with the key, you know, radio stations, newspapers, whatever outlets it is um, that, you know, really are speaking to the community and again, are these trusted messengers. So just, I'm so proud to be able to join you all today. Um, if I could just take one more moment to introduce the newest member of our team, who's a senior advisor and a speechwriter, um, Vinay Reddy, who has just joined um, the vice president's team, but is not new to the um, to the Biden family, and um, just really honored to be able to introduce him as our newest senior advisor. Welcome, okay. uh, Great. Well, thanks, Julie, for that. Thanks for everyone for joining. I know there's a lot going on in everyone's lives. We really appreciate the time. Um, you know, I'll be very quick because there's a lot of great stuff to hear from today. As Julie mentioned, I just joined, but I've been you know with with uh, uh, the VP for many years now. I serve as his uh, head writer in the White House. And it's an amazing job in that one in particular, because as much as you get to see, you know, the world and the, and the country, you really get to see people through his eyes and sort of, you know, how he views politics, public policy, and the responsibilities that, you know, our leaders should take on their shoulders. And he always sees people where they are. It's never with judgment. It's sort of with compassion. And it's especially so, I think, for so many immigrant families. Um, understanding the struggle, the hopes that we have when you come here, the dreams you have for your kids. And it's not just sort of an abstract policy for them, right? So like whenever you're speaking, whatever you're talking, whatever you're doing, it's, it's got to be real. You got to feel it. And I, you know, this whole idea of compassion and empathy, you know, we always kind of think, oh, it's sort of like too deep of concepts, but it's a real thing. And with him, it is a very real thing. And, you know, and it's personal, you know, you know, my two daughters were born when I was working for them and people are like, oh man, that's going to be a really stressful job to do. And other people are like, it's going to be the best place you can have kids working for Joe Biden because the first thing he's always going to ask is, what's your obligation to your family first? And so that would be it. You know, first thing you'd ask, how are your daughters doing before you'd actually get any work done? How's your mom doing? How are your parents doing? All the small stuff matters. And I think we're seeing that now in a time where we feel disconnected from each other, where we feel like, you know, are we really losing something deeper than a lot of the stuff that we see? And, and I think he's uniquely situated to sort of 
bring that sense of uh, belonging back, to not cast each other aside or alone. And, you know, the other thought here is, you know, one of the most memorable experiences is he was the first vice president to host the Diwali um, uh, reception at his home at Naval Observatory. And it was in the November 2016 after the election. Obviously, a lot of us were very disappointed and felt that that campaign in particular was run on a very divisive um, uh, posture against uh, immigrants and people of color. And so, you know, we asked if he can do it. And he's like, yeah, of course. And he opened his home. And we made it such a very multicultural uh, experience. There's people from every background. And and he spent hours with everybody, you know, and then sort of picked us up in a way that I felt only he could kind of do in that moment. And, you know, that's the kind of person I think we're thinking about right now, um, that what's needed right now in the country, in the world, frankly. And, but it's not just sort of the human empathy, right? It's like really trying to understand where people are and doing something about it. And so it's not just being against someone or something. It's really thinking about the real core issues that you're facing in your life. And so, there's going to be an election, one on the margins. It's going to be very tough for the reasons everyone has talked about already. Um, but the other thing we can think about is when we are talking to your aunties and uncles, to your friends, to your cousins who, you know, are longtime voters, first-time voters, are unsure, is really deliver the things that he will do to make your life better. And that's why we have such an incredible lineup today of people who give you that sort of like, you care about your small business, this is what we can do, you want to, you want to, you know, send your kids to a good school. Here's what we're going to do. All the things that really matter to your life every you single that. day that you will have someone there in the Oval Office who that will be here. Then I thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, we lost you for a little bit. Um, Tom, you've been a really good friend. Um, really just want to say, first of all, thank you for helping us pull this together and getting all these people assembled and for inspiring us every day with your strategy, your hard work. Um, Julie, um, you know, other than saying that your grandfather was obviously a great man, um, and today, you know, Tom talked about Representative John Lewis. Um, the fact is that uh, you both come from incredible heritages. You know, Tom was the son of Dominican immigrants to this country and became the Secretary of Labor of the United States. Uh, these things are only possible in America. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Stay engaged. Our community needs you. We need to win this election. Namaste. Thank you, sir. And let me now invite my panelists. We have these four superstars from the Indian American firm. And <laughs> please join me so we can have a little bit of a conversation about some of the policy issues that Vinay was actually talking about. Uh, so can we ask Vivek Murthy, Sonal Shah, Rich Verma, and Neera Tandon to please join us. So, so as they are assembling, um, I don't think we can see Sonal yet. I, oh, there she is, of course. Um, and Vivek, uh, you were the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. Hi, Neera. Uh, co-founder of Doctors for America, and now you're an advisor to Vice President Biden during this uh, health crisis, this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Sonal, you're an economist. You were in the Obama White House. Um, you were also founding executive director of a new institute at Georgetown, and you were the national policy director for the Buttigieg campaign. Rich, I think everybody knows who Rich is. Um, lawyer was the first ever U.S. Ambassador to India, Indian origin. How's that uh, sound? It just sounds great. I'm Assistant Secretary of State before that. And Neera, um, I mean, there's a lot of things people say about you. The one thing I love is, I, I love to say that she is the person who helped to draft the Affordable Care Act. Um, and you've worked in many different roles, but you also run what in the popular press is called a prominent left-leaning think tank. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know whether that's a compliment or a, you know. I'll take it as a one. Miss, but take it as a compliment. So could I start with Vivek and each of you take a few minutes, please, from your perspective. I think our community needs leaders to tell them why. Why is this important to us, this election and so on? So what do you believe are the things that, A, you think Indian Americans should focus on as they think about this campaign? And then from a particular perspective, Vivek, from healthcare, um, 
you know, Sonal from, I call it broadly speaking, if you will, domestic policy, but immigration in particular, uh, Rich from foreign affairs and US-India relations, and Neera from the perspective of healthcare and the economy and the Supreme Court. What is important about this election to you and why are you actively involved? Let me start with Vivek. Well, thank you, Shekhar. It's so nice to be with everyone who's joined together today. Uh, even though we are not in person and I can't see all of your faces, it is uh, it is a feeling of being like home uh, and being close to uh, people from my community. So I deeply appreciate this opportunity to be together. Um, you know, there are a few thoughts I wanted to share, but let me just start with what is on all of our minds at the moment and what we're reading about in the papers every day, which is the hopefully once in a lifetime pandemic that we are experiencing living through right now with COVID-19. You know, our, our country, unfortunately, has hit some, uh, some grim milestones, uh, even as of today. We have more than 70,000 new cases of COVID-19. We have more than 3.6 million people who have been diagnosed with the infection, and that is almost surely a massive undercount. And we've lost nearly 140,000 people uh, to this virus. The good news uh, about these last few months has been that people have stepped up in extraordinary, way, extraordinary ways. In hospitals, for example, we've seen nurses and doctors who have just put their own lives on the line uh, at times to work to serve their patients, even when they haven't had the equipment to protect themselves, the masks, the gloves, and the gowns. Uh, we've seen neighbors stepping up to help neighbors. We've seen organizations uh, step up to take care of their employees and to contribute uh, to hunger causes and food banks because so many people are going without uh, the support and the food they need. Uh, we've also seen some elected leaders step up as well. I've seen governors like Governor Whitmer in Michigan uh, step up to take sometimes unpopular choices, but often the right choices as guided by public health to protect her population. Mayor Ke Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta, another example of somebody who has stepped forward to speak up uh, for public health measures, knowing that people's lives are at stake. But what I worry about is that when we look at the overall trajectory of our country with COVID-19, it has not been good. And the truth is that many of the lives we are losing are lives that could have been saved. Many of the cases that we're seeing could have been prevented if we had had a more robust public health response. And the truth is, and, and I say this with some degree still of shock, is that you know having worked in the Obama administration during the time of Ebola and Zika, having uh, worked with colleagues also from prior administrations, Republican and Democratic administrations who had managed public health crises. I never thought I would see the day where our country faltered so badly in the face of the greatest pandemic of our lifetime. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing. If, if you look at other countries, especially other industrialized countries, they've seen cases go up and then they have taken strong action to bring those cases all the way back down and then they have put testing and contact tracing and other measures in place to keep cases at a low level. We did something very different. We went up, we came down a little bit, and then we surged up once again, far beyond where we were even in March and April. And there's only one other country that has performed that poorly in those terms, and that is Iran. And so we find ourselves in a scenario where we are at the bottom of the pack. And it's not because we don't have the right scientists it's not because we don't have good doctors and hospitals. It's not because we don't have a citizenry that's smart enough and thoughtful enough to understand how to protect themselves. It turns out it's because of our leadership. And this is the truth, is that just like a car can have the best engine, the best safety features, the best GPS uh, system, if it doesn't have the right driver, the driver doesn't know what they're doing, that car will crash. You will not get to where you need to go. And that is what we are seeing. I wanna end with one quick thing about, uh, about why, why Joe Biden. And you know, I've spent my life not participating in policy or politics for, for much uh, of my, my, my tenure, but I was drawn into politics, into policy because of the urgency of this moment that we had around healthcare. Um, and I find that a moment has emerged once again, a time where we desperately need new leadership when it comes to healthcare. I spent time on the phone uh, each week uh, with Vice President Biden, briefing him on COVID-19. I work closely with his team to develop some of the strategies and plans around COVID-19. What I can tell you is that the Vice President is incredibly thoughtful and incisive uh, and very sharp when it comes to 
thinking about COVID-19, asking the right questions, but also proposing ideas that he knows will help people in the short term, but that will also help us for the next pandemic. And that's exactly how we need to be thinking. But it's not just about his skills. It's about his character. Because uh, what I will share with you is when I was confirmed to be Surgeon General, uh, a confirmation that was by no ways assured, that was incredibly difficult, and that would not have happened had it not been for the support of this community, of the Indian American community and friends like Shekhar and friends like Mirai. And that moment when I was finally confirmed and was ready to be sworn in, the person who stepped up to swear me in was actually Vice President Biden. It wasn't something he had to do. In fact, it wasn't even a routine, but he did it. And I will always remember what he did at that swearing in before it started, when the cameras were off in the back room uh, behind the, the stage. My, I, had been, I was gathered there with my mother and my father and my sister and my, my wife, Alice, but also with my grandmother, who I was fortunate to still have with me and is still here about 15 feet away from me here in, my, in the house today. And she was in a wheelchair. And when the vice president walked in, he immediately saw her and he went straight up to her and he got down on the floor on one knee and he took her hand in his hand and he looked into her eyes and he said, grandma, look at what you've done. And he pointed to all. Mm. He pointed to all the people who had assembled there. And what he knew is he knew our story. He knew that our story in the Indian American community was very similar to that of many other immigrants where our parents and the generations before us made extraordinary sacrifices for us to come here. And I know that whatever jump I make in my life from where I started to where I end up, it will never equal the leap that my parents made and the sacrifices that they and my grandparents made. And I related that story to him a couple of years ago. I said, sir, do you remember saying that to my grandmother? And he said, yes, Vivek, I remember that, but you forgot the other thing I told her. He said, I also told her, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for choosing the United States as a place to entrust your family with, to make your home. Hmm. And that was such a beautiful sentiment, but I remember it often because it reflects who he is, his recognition and appreciation for immigrants and for communities like ours is forming an incredibly important part of the backbone of the United States of America. This is a moment for our country when leadership matters, when values matter. And when we go to the voting booth, as we think about how to build support for the candidate that will best reflect our vision and our hopes and our dreams, let's lead with our values and let's vote for the person who understands us. And I believe in that election, in this election, a candidate is Joe Biden. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Mira, I'm going to give you the hard job of following that. Um, but you've been, uh, Mira, in politics, in economy, in policy for a long time. First, just touch on what, not so much what our current president has screwed up, because I, we, that could take too long, frankly. But tell us a little bit about what advice you're giving the Biden campaign on issues that really matter to people that are listening. Um, you know, immigration reform, uh, the economy, things that you work on every single day. Mira Tandem, please. You need to come off mute, Mira. Uh, I thought I'd unmuted myself. I'm so sorry. I'm, it's really fantastic to be with such a tremendous group of leaders, Shaker, who's been uh organizing uh energizing uh the indian american community for so long and as a great friend to all of us vivek rich sonal these are tremendous leaders uh and so i'm really just honored to be with them and i i think i'm just gonna say a few things briefly because i want to make sure we have time for everyone first and foremost the, the work we're doing and the work i'm doing with the biden campaign is really to try to develop ideas we have a been, we are facing probably the largest scale economic crisis we have seen in decades and in many ways, and it's going to be deeper and longer lasting and, and, and more profound uh, than, and, than any of our recent shocks. And so I think what's been really important is that the vice president sees this crisis through the eyes of everyday people. He does not care about how the stock market is doing. 
He cares about how people are suffering and he has developed an economic agenda that is focused on addressing the needs people have, which is investing in jobs, investing in small businesses, investing in key challenges for the country, domestic production, organizing uh, the, the largest scale fight that the United States has ever had on the climate crisis. Most importantly, coming up soon, there will be a speech on caregiving and, and really investing in childcare and actually making the deep connections between how these investments also help us over the long term become more economically productive and have a stronger economy that grows for everyone. And I really want to highlight this. I think this is such a deep part of the vice president's character, which is he, uh, when I worked in the White House and was working on healthcare or working on particular economic issues from my perch at CAP, I, I would you know, be in meetings with the vice president. And what was so um, important about his voice is that he always focused on how what he was doing was going, what the administration was doing was actually going to affect real people. And Vivek is absolutely right. He sees the country as, uh, as, as not just one vision of America, but a true vision of America where all communities are represented, Indian Americans, South Asians, African Americans, Latinos. It's a, it's a vision that includes all of us and he forms policies to address that. And so whether it's concerns about how small businesses are doing in this pandemic and how we're going to revitalize communities left behind, he has, he's developing ideas where he's really thinking about all of us. And that's how I just, uh, I would just leave this, which is to say, Rich can talk about this more, but one of the speeches we were honored to host the vice president at was a speech actually about his, his he was traveling to India and he chose to make a speech about US-India uh, relations ahead of that speech at CAP. And, you know, he was able to connect not just the connections between these two governments, but really between two people and two peoples. And the he saw so clearly, really in a sense from the immigrant perspective, what it means to come to the United States and honestly, how much that is a source of strength, the immigrant experience, the experience of Indian Americans in the United States is a source of strength. And because he understands that, I think he will be a president that we, are, we will all be so proud of. And that's why I will just add my voice to say, it is vital, not that you're here today, which I'm glad that you are. It's important, it is absolutely vital that you take steps every day over the next three and a half months to make sure Joe Biden becomes president. It is up to all of us. Call your cousins and friends, call your neighbors and call your friends, the long lost friends you've had in these, in these swing states. We have to organize in new, way, new ways. It's going to take person to person contact. And I just hope everyone here will, will engage in that way. Thanks, Thank Shaker. Thank you, Neera, appreciate it. Um, Rich, you're our foreign policy guru. What can you tell us about your engagement with the Biden campaign and specifically around the issues of US-India? Yeah, Shaker, thank you so much. And again, thank you for your leadership over many, many years galvanizing the community. It's been incredible and it's an incredible honor to be with all the other panelists who I've had the pleasure of working with and knowing for, for a long time. And I'm really excited to talk about Joe Biden in the foreign policy space and as it pertains to India and how good he really has been for South Asians, for Indian Americans, and for the US-India relationship. And this is something I've watched personally. So let me just say from a personal perspective, I've had the great pleasure of working with Senator Biden when he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee nearly 20 years ago. So there was no one in the Senate who knew more about foreign policy. Every member of the Senate, Democrat and Republican, would go to him for advice. Every foreign leader who came to Washington would go to him for counsel. And on India, I can confidently say there would have been no US-India civil nuclear deal but for Joe Biden. And I will tell you, in 2006, uh, I remember remarks he made where he said, quote, my dream is that in 2020, the two closest nations in the world will be India 
and the United States. If that occurs, the world will be safer. Think about that for a second. He made those remarks in 2006, and here we are, folks, it's 2020. Let's make Joe Biden's dream a reality that only becomes a reality if he becomes president. Now, the other uh, thing I got to see was Joe Biden on a personal level, and I got to know uh, Senator and Vice President Biden as an individual. I saw the inclusive staff he built to include South Asians and Indian Americans. I saw him at the cultural and community events talking about the contributions of the diaspora community. I traveled with him to the Middle East, to Iraq. I saw how he cared, not just for us, but for all those serving our country abroad. And because I worked in the Capitol just a few feet from the Senate floor, I saw him bring his things to the Senate each night on those nights of late votes so he could sprint to the last train to take him home each evening just so he could say goodnight to his kids. That's the Joe Biden I know, foreign policy expert, friend of Indian, champion for social and racial justice and so much more. And there's so much that has to be done, repairing our, our US standing in the world, restoring our leadership on climate, on human rights, non-proliferation, trade, global health. But on India specifically, let me just say this. Um, he has been out in front. When he went to Mumbai just a few uh, years in, into the Obama administration, he called the US-India partnership the defining partnership in the century ahead. And there's no question that under his leadership, he would, he would shape, help shape international institutions like the UN to give India a seat on the Security Council. He would fulfill their status as a major defense partner. He would work together to, with India to keep our citizens collectively safe. That means standing up against cross-border terrorism and standing with India when its neighbors attempt to change the status quo. But I think most importantly, as both Vivek and Neera have talked about, you know, foreign relations are built on the backs of individuals, the individual contributions that are made. And in our situation, it is the, of the contributions made by 4 million Indian Americans. Uh, like my dad, who arrived in the United States with $14, like my mom, who was a special needs teacher and worked so hard, to fulfill the American dream. And let's be honest, that vision, that dream in America is at risk. This president is not only anti-immigrant, he's been flagrantly racist and bigoted, uh, spewing hate towards Asian Americans, towards South Asians, and look, treating Indian national green card holders and Indian students so poorly. We used to be a welcoming country. That welcome mat has been pulled up, including for our friends in India and South Asia. That's not the America I know. That's not the America my parents knew. It's not the America that allowed their son to go back to the country of their origin and represent the United States. There's no question President Biden would build a more inclusive, tolerant, just, and fair administration that would take U.S.-India relations to new heights. So thank you, Shaker. Thank you, thank you, Rich. Sonal, I'm gonna let you bring it home and then I'm gonna do a quick rapid fire with you uh, to bring this to a conclusion. Sonal Shah. Great, thank you, Shaker. And what a pleasure to be on with, uh, with Vivek, Neera Tandon, and Rich Verma. You can't go wrong uh, with the three of them on any panel. So what an honor and what a pleasure. And I just wanna make a sh quick shout out to Neera. She's been sort of a hero for a long time. She was in politics when I first got in and everybody would point to Neera and be like, that's who you need to know. Um, so it's so great to be, to, to great to be able to work with her. Uh, and I also wanna thank Amit uh, Jani for all of his work. And I know he's doing a lot on, on uh, with the Indian community and as well as with the AAPI community. So really appreciate it. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to wrap this with three things, and I think uh, one, uh, you know, 
character and values matter. I mean, every, everybody else has said it. Uh, there is, we can talk about statements, we can talk about comments, we can talk about lots of things. At the end of the day, the person you vote for has to have character and has to have values. And you've already heard from uh, Vivek Murthy, just, just the values he showed to his grandmother and to his, to his family in, in, uh, when he was being sworn in. And that, that doesn't come because somebody just says things. It comes because somebody actually believes it and understands it. And that belief is very important. I have been a recipient of it in different ways. When I was at the White House working with him, always, always looked at you in the face, always had a conversation with you, asked about your family, asked about um, how everyone was, and even willing to call them if you wanted him to call him right there and then, because that's just who he is and those values matter. And all of you, all of, all of you in this, uh, on this call come with values. You came to the United States. Uh, my parents, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, everybody came here with a set of values. You built community. You took care of each other. You took care of others you didn't even know. That's who Joe Biden is too. So if we believe in those values in our community, that's the same set of values Joe Biden believes in. And that is what you build countries on and what you build uh, institutions on. You built it on character and values. So that's one. Two, he is the right president for this time. Um, if there, there is a crisis that Joe Biden has not seen, I do not know. We went through the financial crisis in 2008 together. When we first came in in 2009, we had no idea if we were going into a depression or if we were gonna stick it out and make it through, through that crisis. Joe Biden, you know, every single day, he was making sure where that money was going. Are we making sure jobs were being created? Are we helping communities? That's the questions he was asking. He's been through that. He led us through the Ebola crisis uh, when it happened in the Obama administration. And he had a, he knew how to do that. He, he kept us informed, but at the same time had clarity of vision of where we should go. He knows how to manage crises and he's been there. And Rich already told you what he was already doing in the Senate. So this is what he knows. And then finally, I think this is just personal for me. I think that, you know, look at all of us. We've all been in some way, shape or form influenced by Joe Biden. We are immigrants. I'm a first generation immigrant, right? My parents came here when I was four years old and I have been a beneficiary of someone saying, hey, you belong here. You belong in my administration. You belong in the work that we're doing and giving us those opportunities to do that. All of us on this call have benefited from that because Joe Biden has stood there for the Immigration Acts, has been there for when we wanted to pass the immigration bills, ha understands the value of immigrants and what they bring to this country and why they come to this country. We all come because we want to create a better, better lives for our families and our kids and our generations to come. And that's just who he is. So again, going back to character and values, that matters. And we've all benefited from it. And, and, and we need to pass that same on for the next generation. So why I'm voting for Joe Biden is I want a country that is open to people like me and to my friends and to my colleagues and to everyone else to know that we can create a better country together because we are part of the American fabric. We are not just immigrants. We are not just, you know, people sitting on the side. We are part of that American fabric and welcome us in to help create that fabric because we've been lucky enough to be able to do that. But it took people like a Joe Biden to allow us and help us participate and give us those chances. And we've benefited from that. So now I vote because I believe he is the right person and we can build that country together with him. Thank you, Sono. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, because I know we're running a little bit behind, we started a little late, so I'm going to ask the audience's indulgence. We need a few more minutes because um, we got uh, tons of questions. We've sifted them. So I'm going to ask one question of each of you separately, and uh, if we can keep our remarks to about a minute in response. Uh, I'll, let me start with you, Vivek. Um, what are you hearing and telling uh, Vice President Biden right now? that needs to be done to support frontline workers? This question comes from Dr. Vijay Mehta in Temple, Texas. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Mehta, um, also affectionately known as Uncle Vijay, as a lot of us call him. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. So there's actually a lot that uh, Joe Biden is, has in mind uh, to strengthen our healthcare systems and more importantly, the situation for frontline workers. Number one, in this COVID-19 era, he recognizes that sending our healthcare workers uh, to war in a sense without masks and glo gloves and gowns is, is like sending our army to battle without 
the armor that it needs and to, to protect itself. And he has an aggressive uh, plan in place to actually develop and create the PPE, the protective personal equipment that clinicians need so they don't have to worry about getting sick and bringing it home to their families. The second thing that I should note is he also has a plan in place for providing better mental health care and supports to people on the front lines, recognizing just how traumatic it can be and how anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorders show up later. And finally, well, there's a lot more we can talk about here because actually he has both COVID-19 related plans but many outside that. I'll just mention, mention this that he recognizes that the root of so many problems our frontline healthcare workers are seeing is actually a public health system that has failed. Because public health is not working in communities, illnesses are developing and showing up on the doorsteps of nurses and doctors around the country. So he has an aggressive plan to build a public health workforce, to invest in addressing the social determinants of health, to create a public option so that there's more competition for insurance companies and so that you can drive down costs. And finally, to he has an aggressive plan to negotiate uh, with insurers using the power of the federal government to bring down drug costs so that we can lower the amount of out-of-pocket expense for people who have chronic illness. Got it. Um, Rich, if I may go to you because there seems to be a lot of chat in the room. This one is from Priya Dayananda in New York, Pennsylvania. And it really has to do um, with you know, I, a whole series of things. And I want to add Sumit Sharma from Cary, North Carolina. Um, the questions keep coming up. A, is a new, is a President Biden uh, going to be good for India? We've, they've asked questions. They've said things about other parts of the dialogue. So there seems to be this disinformation campaign, frankly, which I consider very divisive. What can you speak, say speaking to that? Um, and then, Neera, I'm going to come to you on the whole issue, on, this, on a very similar issue, but it's foreign policy, but what can we do to avoid the community getting divided by disinformation? Rich, first. Shaker, thank you. You know, Shaker, if we didn't have a record, this would be a hard question to answer, and we would just have to guess about, you know, what we think might happen. Shaker, we've got a 30-plus year record on U.S.-India relations with the vice president taking a lead role, not as an observer, but and not as just a simple senator, as a either the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee or the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Ask anyone in the Bush administration if the civil nuclear deal would have occurred without Joe Biden's leadership. And then just look at the eight years of the Obama-Biden administration first administration to argue for a seat on the UN Security Council for India, first administration where a president visited India twice during its term, first administration where a US president sat as the guest for Republic Day, first administration to make India a major defense partner, first administration to increase the complexity of our military exercises, first administration to take our relationship with India global, the Paris Climate Agreement the global health security agenda, doing development work in other nations, uh, sharing intelligence, standing up against cross-border terrorism, building up our presence in Asia, and standing up for individuals, and an administration that had more Indian Americans than any other administration in history. Give me a break. This is going to be the best president for U.S.-India relations that we have ever had. Wow. So, you know, what do we do about disinformation? Because what you see in the chat and you see all these things, and Sonal, I'm going to ask you the same question. And I, you know, you should know there was a question from Dr. Isha Saeed also about the Affordable Care Act, but I'm going to have to jump over it a little bit and go to Sovit's question and Priya's question. So, Nira, disinformation, there's a lot of it out there. What do we yeah, do? so I'd say the most uh, the most vital thing for all of us is to be is to recognize the problem, which is um, disinformation flows often from sources that don't know it's disinformation. So one of the challenges of the era we live in is that people spread information online, and when you receive something from someone you know, you think it's accurate. And I just think for all of us, over the next three and a half months. If you're getting material about Joe Biden, you have to really check it, even if it comes from a source you know. If you're on Facebook and a friend or a relative is sharing information 
and uh, and it sounds wrong, it may well be wrong, even though it's been shared by someone you know, or it seems like it's shared by someone you know. So that's that is the most critical thing in this moment. We are many entities. Uh, foreign countries that are using social media to divide Americans against each other. And of course, we have a president who wants to divide people against each other and an ecosystem in online on Facebook and elsewhere where it is easy to divide people against each other because that information spreads very quickly and the social media companies haven't done enough. So when you see something that says that Joe Biden as favors somewhere or as favoring one group or another of, uh, and anything that seems divisive, I, we're all here to tell you it's very likely to be wrong and you actually have to spend some time looking at real sources, neutral sources for accurate information. I think the campaign is getting up information that's accurate about his record, but just one asset Joe Biden has is that we've all known him for a long time, right? He's been in the public eye. He has a record with the Obama administration. He has a record with the Senate. He has never done anything but divisive to pick one group against each other in his life. It's not who he is. So if you see that material, or more importantly, you hear from your friends and family, part of the reason why this call is so important is that you now have tools from the information we've shared to fight back against disinformation. And that I hope that is really up to all of us. We know the Trump administration, the Trump campaign is going to do that. It's using Facebook to divide people against each other already. Its ads are divisive. They are filled with lies. You need, to, we all need to be soldiers against in this fight. Thank you, Neera. Really appreciate it and all the work the DNC is doing as well. So Sonal, you get to take us home. What is the one thing you would say for somebody who's an Indian American who's sitting on the fence that would say, hey, can't sit on the fence, you've got to move, and why should you vote for Joe Biden? So uh, I can only speak personally, right? And, and as I have said to my own family and friends, we can't afford to sit on the fence. This is a country we get to build together. This is about your kids. This is about your grandkids. This is exactly why we all came to this country, why we emigrated to this country. We get to build a country. Democracy isn't sitting on the fence. Democracy is using your opportunity to vote. Democracy is actually participating. Democracy is stepping up when the time is right. And it is our time to step up. As Neera said, as Rich has said, as Dr. Murthy Vivek has said, Joe Biden is exactly who you see. There is nothing hidden about Joe Biden. If you think there is an alternative agenda, read everything he has ever said publicly. Read everything he has ever said on the record publicly. You can go find his speeches in the Senate from when he was there. There is everything is available. If you do not believe any of that, call us, ask us. We would be happy to validate for you who he is. There is nothing that you do not know about Joe Biden. He makes, he's as happy as you see. He makes mistakes like you see. He's funny as you see. He is who he is and he has been that way for the last 30 years. We have to step up. If we have issues on how the camp, how the administration runs, we still have a responsibility to step up. And that means when, when he's president, we will walk in and we will also have those conversations to say, this is what our community cares about. It doesn't end because you voted for him. It ends when you when he wins and we can still step in and have that conversation. So there's no end to this. It is actual participation. It is actually participating in the democracy. It's being a part of the democracy. And I, and I say this again, look at the four of us. We are immigrants whose families have benefited, including you, Shaker, all of us who, are, who have benefited from this party, the Democratic Party, embracing us, taking us on, giving us these chances, allowing, not just allowing us, giving us the opportunity to participate and do everything that we can and stepping in. And when we did, and when you, the community, stood behind Vivek Murthy, and when Joe Biden gave him support, that is what matters. It does not end when Joe Biden's elected. We will still have a responsibility to make this work. And this is our job. Joe Biden is the right person to become the president of the United States. He is 
and character matters. Please, let's be clear. We don't need presidents who want to divide us. We need a president who wants to make progress moving forward. We deserve it as a country. We deserve it as a people. But frankly, we owe it to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sonal. Very powerful. Um, what can I say? Uh, look, um, Vivek, uh, Rich, Sonal, Neera, I certainly hope and pray that Joe Biden listens to some of this and puts several of you in his cabinet or the sub-cabinet. I can't wait to come to your swearing hands. And for this community to win is what Sonal said. It's not just about the election and your vote. It's the issues. It's convincing your, your neighbors and your uncles and aunties. By the way, thank you all for not calling me uncle. I really appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm going to let you go because I want to thank the speakers and co-hosts and all the volunteers. Um, basically, I'm, we're going to show a slide that tells you how you can participate in this campaign. So Vaibhav, if you'll show the slide, um, because the bottom line here is we need to stand up. We need to be counted. On, and just literally listen to the words of uh, Congressman John Lewis. Um, he said, we have got to stand up and be counted when there's any injustice in the world. At this point, uh, there is injustice in the world and we need to stand up together. We need to stand up for people we believe in. So, and if you want a seat at the table, you have to fight for it. The four people you've seen and heard from um, they didn't get it by accident. They worked for it. And you and I have worked for it. So we deserve this. So join a chapter, join a committee of South Asians for Biden, write an op-ed, call friends, use your WhatsApp feed to give positive messages about why you should elect Joe Biden. Talk about these four superstars in our community. And also look at leaders who are already running for office like Sarah Gideon and Srikal Kearney and Carol Tipperney and Ronnie Chatterjee. They're on the ballot, guys, and they're in your states. Go help them out, because if you help them get votes, those votes go to Joe Biden too. Um, and you will remain engaged, because as Joe Biden says so eloquently when he first announced, he said, stay engaged. This is a fight for the soul of our nation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's not the last time you'll be hearing from us. Get up, get out, and let's go and vote. Thank you.
Do that. 